everybody. Uh, my name is Dina D'Souza and I am your host <laughs> for the next half hour and um, I know Grant very well even though I don't have a Scottish accent. I have lived here in Edinburgh for 25 years so um, I'm a board member of the Scottish Association. I did not know James and Marianne, but I have just met them this morning, so I will let them introduce themselves afterwards. And um, after we are a small group, I know that not everybody feels comfortable asking questions out loud, so we do have the app for if you want to ask a question. But if you are comfortable, since it's a small, intimate group, we can just ask questions um, on a personal basis. So. Thank you. Thank you. James, do you want to start? Because your slide's already up. Yeah, so, that, that would it's almost sense. like you planned it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll stay seated if that's okay. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm James, James O'Connor, and I run the youth service for the Huntington's Disease Association covering England and Wales. Um, so sort of very briefly, without going into lots of detail, we have sort of two main branches within um, our association. We have our specialist Huntington's Disease Advisor Service. They work with anybody who has Huntington's, anyone sort of with a connection to Huntington's, be it carers, professionals, family members, whatever it might be. Um, and that tends to be over the phone, telephone and advice service. Also offering face-to-face -face stuff. Um, COVID sort of had a little bit of an impact on that, as you can appreciate, but it, it, it's, it's going back to that model. And then um, there is our youth service as well. So we offer emotional and practical support to anyone 8 to 25. Also working with parents if they're wanting to start, curious as to know how to start having the conversation about Huntington's, when's a good time, good use of language, that sort of stuff. Uh, we also try and ingratiate ourselves with any professional networks. School's quite a good entry point to try and um, work with people as well as sort of CAMs, social services, whoever it might be. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about us. I'll pass on to Marianne. Hello, everybody. My name is Marianne. I am Manager of Youth and Community Services at the Huntington's Disease Society of America. Um, so I probably started getting involved with the National Youth Alliance, which is the youth branch of HDSA, about 10 years ago as a volunteer. And I sort of dove in headfirst, thinking, like, this is exactly where I belong. I wanted to make sure that... Um, as a volunteer that no one felt alone in their HD journey and that's exactly what we do we well we try to do so since then I say I'd say the NYA started uh, doing different sessions at our annual convention about uh, 15 20 years ago and that's where it sort of was born and since then we've been able to do we do four retreats every year and they're just a smaller uh, groups in different regions of the country. We also have five youth social workers um, that work around the country do one-on-one -on -one services for young people impacted by HD and they also provide support and education to healthcare providers, um, any schools, parents, things like that about any kind of array of topics of talking to their kids about HD or how to just explain what HD is right to maybe somebody their professor or teacher. Um, we also do support groups every month, and um, we do we hold uh, bi-weekly sort of topic-specific support groups. Um, they're sort of just we pick different topics based on what the community's needs are. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Welcome. Don't you worry, nobody at all. Welcome. And I'll go back. So I'm Grant Walker. I'm the Youth Service Lead for the Scottish Huntington's Association. And we also support children and young people from the age of 8 right through to 25. But that 25 can sometimes be 35, can sometimes be 40. Um, so, and we work in a very similar model to James and Mary Ann where we kind of have three prongs to our support. Um, the big one being uh, for young people. So it's bespoke, individual 
support for their situation. So we'll go into their schools, we'll take them to McDonald's, we'll take them wherever and talk about what's happening for them, where they can just have a chance to offload or moan or cry or whatever they want to share. Um, and it's about giving them the information and empowering them to have the information and knowledge and understanding that their parents and grandparents didn't have, to try to reduce that stigma uh, and just try to bring Huntington's out into the open so that families can talk about it more openly and share um, what's happening for them. Um, we also provide age-appropriate group work and opportunities for them to learn and meet other young people in a very similar situation. So we do um, 8 to 12 year old groups, 13 to 17 and then our over 18s group where they get to do cool fun stuff that they don't normally have a chance to. Um, and then we have our young um, youth ambassadors where they will meet other young people and share stories and connect that way um, and the peer support aspect. We also do what James touched upon where we'll work with parents so we will empower the parent to have that conversation about what Huntington's is and that's also very bespoke because obviously the way you would explain Huntington's to an 8 year old and the way you would explain it to an 18 year old is very different. So we'll spend sessions giving them the language and the tools so that they feel confident to have that chat with them. And then we also do work with professionals, so teachers, social workers, healthcare providers, because so that it's accessible for young people to um, to be involved and to be part of that discussion. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we do, and we kind of try to do what this Congress has done, but try to spread it out over over our time. So I have worked with an eight-year-old, and right through to their like now twenty. I don't want to admit how old they are, but like that whole journey of like. 12, 13 years where they've actually went through their own testing process. Um, so we build up really strong, really strong relationships with them. So that's us. So what we were thinking was we would each cover a topic of what we tried to empower. And then if there are any questions, we would really like it to be interactive. And if we can give you any tips and hints or any skills that you maybe want to take back to your own countries, if this is something that you're thinking about uh, setting up, we're definitely happy to share whatever we can to, um, yeah. Cool. So we thought we'd start by just sort of asking ourselves some questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, we, we, we were talking, well we met about two weeks ago I think, um, and we were talking about what is the most important parts of our service from our perspective. So this is sort of our viewpoint from it, not necessarily the people we work from, uh, work with, but the I would say for, for me personally, from my perspective, I think the most important part of our service is that one-to-one -one support. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question because all our services it is very sort of broad and for, for good reason and, and a lot of it is so important for different people in different ways. But I think from my perspective, just being able to open up some of those conversations with young people who don't necessarily have a space to talk about Huntington's, haven't felt comfortable talking about Huntington's because within the family it might be tricky dynamics, outside of the family people don't know, they don't understand. So that's always been something that I've really sort of valued within, within our service, that one-to-one -one support and giving people that space and that opportunity to talk and, and to access some information because we you know, we, we try, we, we won't necessarily say we're experts, but we, we, know, we, know, we try to know as much as we possibly can so that we can share that with, with young people so they, they feel that they're getting accurate information, which of course is, is hugely significant. I think we would say that they're the expert, but we're the guide that can help them take them through from stage to stage. I think that's how I like to think of it. Like the Sherpa that carries the backpack while they're kind of doing the journey. <laughs> Maybe it's a good way to think yeah. of it. I like that. Um, I would say, I mean, like you said, there's a very broad range of things that we do, but one of the things that I think is most important is, yes, we provide support and we provide platforms where you could learn a lot of stuff, but it's making, giving that opportunity to make those connections with other young people that are impacted by this disease. Because that peer support, I think, is most beneficial and those relationships that you make um, do really last forever, honestly, um, and some things that just stay with you. Peer connection and sharing your story and having young people explain that they're not the only person in the, in the world that's going through what they've been through, because that has a huge benefit on their mental health, on their well-being, to know that they're not alone. Um, so that's really what we see in the, in the SHA, that they bond. And those, those, la those last forever, don't they? Yeah. So. 
Fantastic. So, sort of sp specifically focusing on a topic, Grant, you were going to talk a little bit about reducing isolation yeah. for young people. So when I first started 12 years ago, one of the things we tried to do was, um, everybody in this room knows about the stigma that's associated with HD, and people really um, don't like to talk about Huntington's. And one of the things we really tried to do was break down that barrier, and we started a, a DVD called Out in the Open, and the goal was to have empower families to chat about Huntington's, to not be afraid of even saying the name of the disease, and to start to explore um, how that is and have, have people talk about it within their family um, households. Um, and that's what we've seen, is we are now seeing a generation of young people um, that are not afraid, that are changing that narrative, that are pushing the boundaries and being able to, sh to share their story where grandparents weren't even allowed to acknowledge it. Um, and it's, it's one of the huge things that we're really proud of, that now we don't have that same level of shame that maybe was in previous generations and it's it's kind of mind-blowing to me where this generation or their children might be taking the disease in the future um, so it's one of the things that we're hoping that that will, will kind of permeate um, and go go across go across other countries and i know many other countries are doing similar things um, as well which is good to, good to see cool Marianne, you're going to talk a little bit about mental health and well-being. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot what we see in young people that are impacted is a lot of mental health issues, right? Like whether that's depression or anxiety, um, just from different traumas that might have happened or how they're coping with what they're going through. And I think that providing that one-on-one -on -one support and that foundation of support, just knowing that it's okay to talk about it and sort of breaking down that stigma is really important and knowing that it's okay and validating like what you're going through and what you're feeling and um, being able to provide that support and platforms to talk about it out loud, right? And that non-judgment, right? And just being able to do it in such a comfortable setting. Um, we, we've all talked a little bit about sort of working with other professionals um, and, and that's something I, I quite I, I really value. When I came into this job, um, 2017, I think, so not quite as long, long as Grant, but uh, I'm working towards it. Uh, I came from education, and when I first took on the role, a lot of the sort of challenges and some of the professionals that were involved supporting families seemed quite familiar to me. They seemed like it was something that I'd worked a lot in before. And as I started to understand more and more about Huntington's and got to meet more people and, and hear people's stories, people's journeys, people's experiences, I started to sort of very quickly see actually how Huntington's was at the centre of so many of the, the challenges that young people were facing. And so one of the big things that I really wanted to do, coming at it from sort of, as I say, from a school perspective, was to try and give them more space and more people who understood. So working with schools, I think it's, it's, it's an easy one to go to because most of the people we work with, I'd say, in school, um, and you've got a trusted adult, a safe space where kids can readily access some level of support. And so that, that was a really important part of, of our service for me to, to, to start to change that so that young people didn't have to just rely on, on us. You know, we want to be there as much as we can, but um, I, I am one person, you know, we, we have little teams, but we, we can't be there all the time. And so having somebody close at hand, another professional person that they trust, that they feel comfortable talking with and sharing with, who understood. So again, we've talked quite a lot already about stigmas and barriers and actually sort of talking about Huntington's for, for a lot of young people is quite a daunting prospect because if the first question that they sort of comes back to them after they've just shared how they're feeling is, what is Huntington's? Where they, they can get very easily lost sometimes and understandably so. Same with uh, mental health professionals and social workers. They can come in and it's sort of quick fire responses a lot of the time, but actually th this is nuanced. You know, some of the, the, the Huntington's does lie at the center and does run alongside a lot of the challenges that young people face and families face. So giving them that level of understanding and that sort of more in-depth knowledge allows them to be able to put the right support in place for, for families and young people. Um, so, I'll come to you, Grant. What are, um, what are the benefits of talking about Huntington's? How long have you got? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's just 
Well, we all know about the benefits of talking about Huntington's, that's why we're here. You break down barriers, you meet other people that are connected and you kind of make friendships, don't you? And it reduces that, that fear that I don't want to talk about it. It's okay, you have permission to just talk about it if you wish. If you don't want to, you're going to have to. Um, it's really up to that person how they wish to talk about it. And it's that when people come with us, they're not asked what is Huntington's or how does that affect your family. They just know, they have that connection and they just start to chat about, you know, straight off the bat. So um, we would thoroughly recommend just having that open conversation, just sharing how you're feeling and being honest with your own emotions and then seeing where that takes you um, because that's the only way we're going to bring it out of the shadows and be okay to talk about it is, uh, or be okay with it by sharing our stories. Maria? <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the benefits of talking about hunting. So you're going to say oh, of your sort yeah, of personal yeah, I experience. Like, what else am I going to say? Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so personally, I wanted to share a little bit. So when I was, so just a little bit of background, my mom passed away from Huntington's disease 12 years ago. And so I knew what Huntington's disease, well, I didn't know what it was my whole life, but she was sick my whole life but it was like sort of the elephant in the room growing up until she was diagnosed. And it was to protect me and my family, right? My family was like, don't talk about it. Um, but that really took a toll on my mental health, right, growing up. And I took it, I'm an extremist. If anybody knows me, I do everything to the extreme. And so I never told anyone. And I didn't actually say out loud that my mom had Huntington's disease till I was 19 years old. And she was diagnosed when I was nine. So it took a, me a long time to actually feel comfortable saying it out loud and talking about it. And it wasn't until after she passed that I was like, you know, I'm not going to be scared of this elephant in the room and I'm going to talk about it. And, you know, my family sometimes is against things that I do or how I talk about it on different platforms, um, but I need to do it for myself. I don't push them to do anything that they don't want to do, but they know where to go um, when they do want to talk about it or want to seek support or whatever they might need. Um, so from a, per a personal level, I wish that I had youth services when I was younger. Um, I felt so alone despite my mom was in a long-term care facility for 10 years and with 50 other individuals with Huntington's disease, but I still thought I was the only person in this world that knew what this was. I didn't know there was other young people. I remember my first convention, my first walk, and just looking around and just being like, oh my gosh, I don't have to explain anything to anyone. And I never felt more comfortable in my entire life. And that's where I dove in head first and was like, I need to be part of this and make sure that nobody else feels like how I felt growing up. Rather usefully, for my notes, I wrote down, I'll just repeat whatever Grant says, but in an accent that everyone can understand. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think... Um, I've got my posh voice as well. <laughs> I know you have, actually. So, yeah, fair play. Um, but I think mental health awareness over the last few years has been sort of really, really pushed and, and come to the forefront, which is a hugely significantly an important thing. Um, and the, the sort of the strap line for, for most of it is talk. It's, it's the gateway, it's the start for all sorts of other support. It may be that peer connection is the bit that's most important, um, but actually just by starting that conversation, being able to, so I said, Marianne said there was 10 years until you, until you found that, that confidence to start talking about Huntington's. Once that happened, I mean, look at Marianne now. <laughs> you know. Now I can't shut up. <laughs> um, but all because of, of, of that, that first small step. And, and it, it, it does seem very small, but actually starting that conversation, being able to talk, to be able to share how we're feeling. Grant said it earlier, sort of being honest with ourselves and with our emotions is, is quite a scary thing, no matter what's going on in the world. Um, and yeah, I think that's why talking about Huntington's is, is quite so significant because it is, it's a, it's a starting point and everything that comes afterwards is because that conversation <coughs> happened. And some of the best conversations I've had with young people hasn't been on a one-to-one. -one. It's maybe been in a group or a residential and you're doing something silly 
we once did an activity based on The Apprentice, you know the TV show The Apprentice where they have to make a product and we asked them to make a product for Huntington's and the young people came up with a sticky shoe so they didn't have as many falls as they did. They came up with um, a, a wheelchair that was better for younger people rather than an older wheelchair with flashing lights and streamers and, and amazing <laughs> stuff. Um, they came up with uh, you know, loads of excellent ideas that just gave a wee glimpse into what was going on in their house and how things were going on. And that's a spark that you can then take and you can then discuss when you're in a one-to-one. -one. Or if you're stuck on a paddle boat with a young person all day and you're going to think, how am I going to talk to them about whatever, you can then take that back. So the really good thing about our services is the longevity. So they can dip in and out, they can come to different points when it suits them. Um, and you know, somebody can come at eight and then not come back until they're like 18, 19, 20, thinking about something else. So um, another part of it. I think I would like to hear if there's any questions or anything that would be helpful for you because we've all rambled on. <laughs> and I, know, I know it's a Sunday morning after a party night in platform last night, but is there, is there anything that's, any questions that anybody's got? Or, yes? How do you reach younger people that are not necessarily willing to talk or hesitant? Yeah, that's a good question. Very <laughs> good question. Um, social media? Very good point. So, um, or just putting out the word that, that that we're here, that we're here, and we can we can it's okay to talk. I think it's what they learn, what they grow up with, and what happened with their mum and dad, or what happened with their granddad or their grandparents. So it's just about having sharing the the fact that we're here, and I think I think I don't know what you guys would say, but making it feel that it's whatever it's on their terms. So whatever they want to come and talk to us about, it's okay. So I can sit and chat to a young person for an hour, but only five minutes of that can be about HD, because that's what they need. And it's usually the last five minutes, just when before you're open and leave the door, they drop like this huge bombshell, and you're like, yeah, okay, right, that's okay, right, let's put it that. But yeah, I think it's about on their terms, and what they want to ask, and what they want to come to you about. Um, but yeah, it's really hard, how do you reach somebody if they don't know you exist, or if you're not, you don't know you're there. Um, so maybe it's just about raising that awareness even more. So. Yeah, I was going to uh, just um, jump on that. Definitely spreading the awareness that the services are there, right? Because I talk to healthcare providers all the time and different HD-specific clinics, and I'm like, they're like, but we don't have any young people that come in. And I'm like, but you have people that have children. <laughs> yeah. um, that's who I'm here for, right? Um, they're also impacted by this, and that's why we're here to help them. Right. You know, we see that the parents protect the children a lot of times. Oh, the sure. say, oh, my child has no questions, they don't want this. Yeah. But that I think tough. it might be different. I it's, think if you can reach the children themselves. And, and that's where like social media and things like that. And if they're going to walks, if they're going to, you know, different conferences and just being present is really important. And so when they're ready, they'll know where to go kind of thing. Sorry, apologies, we were a little bit late, but you just touched on the fact that you do residentials. Are you able to expand on that a bit more? And what yeah. age brackets are they for? So we do residentials for 8 to 12, 13 to 17, and 18 plus. And they would come away with us for um, two or three night residential and do different activities, different learning opportunities. It's just an opportunity for them to get respite from their home mm -hmm. and come and share their story with other people. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I, in my experience, when children find out earlier, they just accept it. So eight, nine-year-olds have gone, yep, that's my dad, that's my granddad, that's what's going on. It's when they find out later in life that they have a wee bit more difficulty, they struggle a wee bit more, uh, particularly if it's been kept it's like a secret. It's like, why, why haven't I been included in this family thing that's going on and it really has a big impact on me? So that's what we try to do. We try to make sure that it's, it's okay asking questions and so yeah so if you have it anybody yeah we could certainly have a chat because it's brilliant and, and then we have young people who are maybe like 18 19 who are now going into the world of work and they're like oh my pals have never been white water rafting but i've been with grant and we've done white water rafting we've done paint bottom and we've done those are different things so they don't have a chance at home because they're too busy caring for their mom or their dad or that kind of stuff it's a really, really valuable chance that we, and it's all covered, it's all paid for, so we're fully funded, so there's no cost either, so, 
Yeah. Hello, Charlie. It's <laughs> more to do about your relationship with the professionals and um, obviously when I got um, tested, I was actually really surprised that regardless of testing negative or positive, I didn't come away with a book that, that said, right, you're in the UK, you've got this service, this service, this service, and you've got HGYO. It's just something that I wanted to kind of see in your experience, obviously, you've got Scotland, you've got HGA, and obviously you've got international. And do you find that there's kind of a difficulty sometimes giving you passing your information over to clinics sometimes? And obviously I got tested in Wales, and again, Scotland, HDA covers England and Wales, but obviously Wales is a lot smaller than England, and sometimes it feels like there's so much going on up there and to the side, and we're just kind of like, it varies. <laughs> some clinics are fantastic, um, some genetic centres are brilliant. Um, I take a lot of referrals and do a lot of referrals, so it's very much a two way street. Um, and, and some aren't, if, I, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, I recently, a couple of months ago, uh, gave a presentation at the Genetic Testing Consortium, um, which was at the, the Barbary in, in Birmingham. And I'm assuming in some way or another, most genetic centers and clinics were, were sort of tuned in and tapped into that. So it's not that they're, they're, they're not aware. Um, I guess it's just, it, it, some of them don't always push what you'd expect them to push sometimes. And, and if I'm honest, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd miss stuff myself. You know, it's, it's hard to sort of get, give everything over in one go. Um, but yeah, I think for the, the, those that are well connected with us, it, it is very good. They do publicise, they do promote, they do push, they do encourage. Um, but there are some that, that just don't seem to quite as much. Um, and yeah, I, 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 Cardiff, I, I think I've worked with a couple of people, not, not many. So I don't know if that's a bit of a gap. And, but it does, it does feel unusual for me that that isn't the sort of go-to thing for, for everyone who's in touch with Huntington's Clinic or Genetic yeah, Centre. A few young people and things like that, and obviously um, families as well, and just the idea of the, like, the collaborative booklet, and I know that obviously then someone will change their contact details and things like that, but a generic one which you could go, right, it covers young people in their HDYO, it covers, you know, where you're from, even like with your residential, in case people move, like what's accessible, I just wondered if that's ever been in the pipeline. So in Scotland, we only we have four genetic testing centres, and I think because there's four youth advisors, we all link into our own, and we make really strong connections with the team that's in that local area. So they would know about us, and they would know about our literature packs and the stuff that we can. And we would always be like, don't forget that we're here, push, push it. But I suppose, like maybe in America, it's a, you know it's such a bigger scale that you maybe can't reach everybody in that in that same situation. So. In Scotland, then maybe in England and Wales, we're very lucky with our geography that we can do that. Whereas in Australia, there's probably just no opportunity to reach them all. But yeah, I think I think that um, that's a good idea, and it's something that we can consider so that there is a follow-on. Because genetic centres sometimes you get one follow-up session, and, and that's you. So where do you go after that? After that time, you know? Yeah, I would just say like for America, it's too big to reach every. Um, genetic counselor or neurologist um, where somebody or a primary care physician where somebody might be getting, going through the testing process. Um, for HD even specific clinics that are in universities or institutions, sometimes it's even hard because they're so big and sometimes I'll call and they'll be like, we don't have an HD clinic. I'm like, yes you do. You know, and um, I will give them information sometimes at like the call center. So it is really challenging. Um, but I love when I get those calls from the random neurologist in the middle of nowhere. And they're, um, they're like, I just got somebody that wants to test for this. And I don't feel comfortable doing it. Um, and it's those providers that want to be vulnerable and ask for help, right? But sometimes I wish I had a few extra letters after my name. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's difficult. Can I speak to that a little bit? Because I have extra letters after my name. <laughs> We've tried with HDO. Um, you know, for many years, and I'm with HDO since the inception, 
we have tried to break up, uh, as all volunteers, break up all the list of all the centers we could possibly think about and try to make connections. So if I knew Nando in Italy, I'd reach out, or if I know somebody in Denver, Colorado, we'd reach out. A lot of times the stuff happens to go at the bottom of the pile because they are overwhelmed, they're overworked, and they're afraid. They're afraid to overburden people. So if you are all healthcare professionals, I see some younger people here as well, go back to your centers, and especially the voice of the younger people to say, what would have been really helpful is for you to give us information about HDO. And I have to challenge Charlie a tiny bit, not at a time after a diagnosis, because my feeling is, I don't need to overburden you with all that stuff after I've just told you whether you're positive or negative or intermediate. But as soon as you walk in the door, when I say, tell me about your family, that's when I say, do you know about these resources? And I keep asking those questions because I know what HDO can do. So it, you know, we've tried, you know, Mary, we, we, we've tried. And a lot of the times the stuff that's to the bottom of the pile or the clinicians and the healthcare providers that themselves are just too afraid and they don't know what HDO is to be able to say, you know, oh, it's just for people who have JOHD. It's incorporating that, but this is a really good resource. So if you guys can go back and if that could be part of your mission to say, you know, I learned about this and you should really tell other people about this. I think that that would be a really, you know, that would be something that you can do to empower yourselves as well as your healthcare centers and testing centers. Have we run out of time? Yes. Oh man. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I'm the bad, the bad guy here. Yeah. Um, this has been a fantastic session, I think. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much.